What really matters is do you know him as your personal Savior? So this morning, we're going to look at Paul, and we're going to look at the writings that he gave to this church of Philippi. We're going to begin there in verse 4. Paul wrote him, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. My Lord, for whom I have suffered, and where I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable, or conformable rather, unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let's go to the Lord in a word for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today grateful for your word this morning. Grateful that we can open up the word of God and we can read it and apply it to our lives. Lord, my prayer is that everyone that's come in this morning would leave differently than the God here. That we would be closer to you. That if there's changes in our life that we need to make, that we would make those changes. If there's things that are blocking our, our relationship with you, that we would remove them. Or have you remove them for us. Lord, I pray that if there be one here who needs to know the salvation that your son Jesus Christ gives to us, that they would come to know him today. And that they can leave knowing what really matters is a relationship. I thank you for Holly Springs this morning, Lord. I thank you for what you do for us. And I pray that we would continue to be found doing your will in <coughs> all things. And that you would lead God and direct us as we continue on. And I ask that you bless this message that you'd hide me behind the cross. Just use me as a puppet this morning, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, now we got to we gotta kind of look back at verse 3 in order to understand verse 4. So we're going to have a quick recap of last week in verse 3, it says, uh, for we are the circumcision. Uh, uh, well, let's, let's look at verse 2. It says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And remember that word concision there. Anybody remember what we, we said it meant? Mutilation. It meant mutilation. And, and remember, uh, the Jewish uh, history and the Jewish teaching was that males had to be circumcised on the eighth day, and that was important. And uh, there were some Jewish Christians, or, or even just Jewish people, Pharisees, whatever you may, may have, that were around the church of Philippi here at the time, and how they were telling uh, these people that, hey, if you're not circumcised, you can't be saved. And Paul says, if you're doing that, in order to have salvation, it is nothing more than mutilation. He says those works are no longer the law. We are no longer bound by the law. We are set free from the law because of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to fulfill the law. We're no longer bound by those things. He says these vain traditions and these vain teachings, they are, they are just that. There's some things that are good and that we should keep and that we should try, strive to do, but saying that we, if we don't participate in or if we do participate in a certain thing, that if we have, that we can or can't be saved, and that is wrong. How are we saved, by the way? We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. I'm here to tell you this morning that if you're here today and you believe that you are saved or if you've made a profession of faith and it was in anything other than by grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, then you need to be saved today. That's the only way that we're saved. No more, no less. Jesus paid it all. 
There's nothing that we can add to or take away from that. But then he gets into verse 4. And, and he begins to just show them how real and how serious he is about it. Listen. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I won't. He said, if you think you've done some things to where you can trust in yourself for this salvation, guess what? I got more qualifications, Paul says. Huh. You know, uh, I remember when we went through the book of Romans, and I remember thinking of Paul as this uh, fuzzy, cuddly guy. You know, he, 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 he gave us the Roman road. Of course, we know God wrote all scripture, but Paul was inspired by God to write him. He gave us the Roman road, and he gave us salvation, and he gave us all these things. I thought he was, you know, a really good, nice guy. He was. Sometimes Paul tells it just like it is. And here he tells him. He says, listen, if you think that you've got some things that in your life that you've done that can give you salvation, maybe you've done all the things that the ancient uh, teachings and the traditions, you've, you've accomplished a lot of them. Guess what? I've done more of them. Then he goes on to list them. He says, listen to me. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Why did he start with that? He said, from the very beginning of my life, I have done what I believe was the law, and I've kept the law. From the eighth day of my life, listen, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he says. I am from the stock of Israel. He said, listen, I'm a Jew. I'm from God's chosen people. Who's he talking to here a lot of? A lot of He's talking to Gentiles. Us. We're Gentiles. He's talking to Gentiles here at the church Philippi. And he says, listen, I'm from the stock of Israel. In, in, in terms that we may understand like cattle. He's the purebred of the purebreds. He is the highest of the high. He's the best you can get. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, he says. A Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law. He said, I'm as close to the law. I'm touching it. I ain't way over here on the side. I ain't doing just a few of the things that the law says. I'm touching the law. I'm right there with it. I've done everything. He even goes on and says, I was a Pharisee. Now, he isn't talking in uh, tongue-in-cheek here. Paul was indeed a Pharisee. Paul had met the qualifications and had went through the training and was a Pharisee. Nobody, Paul's saying, nobody knows more about the law and the Old Testament and the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the history of Israel than I do. Nobody knows more about that. He says, and listen, he's telling them, I don't even have confidence in my flesh. He says in verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, listen, I was doing my duty. I was doing what I believed was the right thing. I was persecuting the church because that rebel rouser Jesus came and we had him put to death because he was leading people away from the law and that was wrong. Listen, I want to tell you something. The Pharisees, now, now, now most of them, I believe some of them knew exactly who Jesus was. I believe that they knew when, when Nicodemus went to Jesus in John chapter 3. What did he say? Nicodemus was, by the way, what? He was a Pharisee. And what did he say? He said, we know that there's something different about you. I'm paraphrasing. But we know that you've got to be sent from God. You've got to. But some of them believed they were doing the right thing. Paul believed in his heart of hearts, I believe, as him saying this, that he believed that he was doing the thing which pleased God. He was persecuting the church because this rebel rouser Jesus came and did all these teachings and didn't keep the Sabbath and and he, he had all these things that these people followed. In his mind, he was leading people astray. And so he was persecuting the church. We know of one particular instance uh, that he held the tactics of those who picked up the stones to stone a deacon named Stephen who was preaching the gospel. Uh, if you do some research, and I don't want to state this as fact, but I've done a little bit of research on this, and... Some people will tell you that the one who held the jackets was the one who gave the orders. He was holding the jackets. So there's some who will tell you that Paul's the one who sought him out and said he's got to die, stone him, and he's the one who held the jackets. Now, I don't know that that could be a fact, but that's what some people, some writers will tell you. But in any measure, he was there, and he partook in the killing of Christians, and that's just one that we know. What was he doing on the road to Damascus whenever... Uh, he was blinded by a light, and uh, Jesus blinded 
him and met him on the road to Damascus. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul answered back with Lord. He was going to kill Christians. Notice, though, this is a sub sermon that we ain't going to get into, but notice what Jesus said. He said, Why are you persecuting me? Was he physically persecuting Jesus? No. He was persecuting followers of Jesus. That's how much Jesus loves you and how much Jesus thinks about you, that when you hurt, he hurts. When you are persecuted, he is persecuted. But he, he says, I was blameless. And I, was sta I could stand in the temple. And people would look at me and see a righteous man. I was blameless. He had all the accolades. He had all the smarts. He had all the rules followed. And he was blameless. To the point of being blameless. Yet, we see in verse 7. But what things were gained to me. Those I counted lost for Christ. We live in a world today, people, where people are out to please their self. If, I don't, if it isn't nothing in it for me, I don't want to do it. If there's nothing in it for me, I don't have time for it. Uh, if, if, if there's nothing that I have to gain from it, uh, somebody else can handle it. And then there's a flip side to that. We've got people who believe that they are doing the right thing, but they're doing it for the wrong reason. You remember, I told you when we got started here this morning, that you are only saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. There's a lot of people out there today, who maybe even are meeting today, who believe that you've got to do a certain amount of good things in order to obtain heaven, obtain salvation. I want to tell you this morning, there is no amount of good that you can do and get to heaven. There's no amount of, of money that you can give to the church or the homeless or the needy in order to get to heaven. There's no number of attendance markers that you can put, little gold stars that you can put beside your name in the church house in order to get to heaven. It's not possible. It never has been, and it never will be. And by the way, the law here in which Paul said that he was striving to keep, did the law ever save anyone? No. We know this. People in the Old Testament were saved the same way we are. There's only been one way to salvation throughout the history of all of life, and that is by grace and faith in Jesus Christ. The only difference in Old Testament and New Testament is they were looking forward to a Messiah, and we're looking back to a Messiah. That's the only difference. And it's the same Messiah, Jesus Christ. But he had done all these things. He had, he had done the things that he thought he had to do to attain righteousness. And there are people today who are doing the same things. And what do we see in the book of Matthew whenever Jesus is talking about uh, that there's a broad gate and a narrow way? We talked about it last week just a little bit. And, and the people are coming and they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? We cast out demons. We fed the hungry. I was at church every time the doors were open. I gave money to the church. I was nice to people. I even said things and told people about you, Lord. And what is it, what is it that he's going to tell them? Apart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew. Is that God being unreasonable? Because on the surface, and if we as Christians look at someone who's doing good things, we think they're a good person, and they very well may be. Hell today is full of good people. Hell today is full of churchgoers. Hell today is full of people who have been baptized. But what hell is not full of is people who trusted in Jesus Christ. Amen. There's not a single person in hell today who gave their faith and trust in Jesus Christ by the grace of God. So we've got to understand what Paul says here. I did all these things thinking I was doing the right thing. I worked hard. I tried to be blameless. Kept all the laws. Did what I was supposed to do. I believe Paul probably felt pretty good about himself. What do you think? I believe so. He says those things that were gained. I was built up. I felt good. You know that's the problem with those things. Is it's us feeling like we are working towards something. <coughs> when we know that the scripture tells us that there's nothing that we can do. Jesus Christ, whenever he died on that cross, did all that there ever needed to be done. He paid.
take it off. He goes on to tell us, those things that were gained to me, those I count the loss of Christ. Those things, while I spent that time doing those things, I wasn't doing the things that I should have been doing for the Lord. I wasted those years. I wasted that. It was nothing more than loss. He says, yea, doubtless in verse 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Here's another. Here's another. I love Paul. Here's another saying of Paul. This is how serious he is. He said, those things that I did, and listen, he's not just talking flippantly about it. He lived it. He, he, he spent time and effort and money and did the things and spent a lifetime. You know, to become a Pharisee, it wasn't something you did on the weekends. To be a Pharisee, it was when you woke up in the morning until you went to bed at night, 24-7, 365. He said, those things that I was doing, I count but dumb. I know we don't use that word very often, but everybody know what dumb is? Y'all say yes, sir. I'm going to explain it a little bit more. I want everybody to understand this. What he's calling the works that he did was dumb. No good. He didn't even say that they were nothing. He said they were worse than nothing. Listen, if you got a plate, let's let me give you a visual. If you got a plate, would you rather have nothing on it or dumb on it? I'd rather have nothing on it. He said, I got it for dumb. It's worse than nothing. The way I spent my life. These traditions, these, these teachings, this, this work that I did was good for nothing. That I may win Christ. He said, those things I was doing, I was never going to get to Jesus doing those things. I was never going to find salvation through those things. He said, if I was trying to get to Christ through doing these things, I might as well have just had a bunch of dumb. Pretty powerful words, isn't it? You think about it like that. I believe Paul's serious about what he's talking about here. He said, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Listen, that's all it is. Whenever we think we're doing good and we do these good works, and oh, we've got to be baptized. I've been baptized. I've been, listen, baptism ain't never saved nobody. Baptism is important, and I think us as Baptists sometimes we 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 lower uh, baptism down to listen. Baptism is important. If you've never trusted the Lord, follow the Lord in scriptural baptism, you need to. But understand, it doesn't save you. And, and he said, "I did all these things. I did them for my own righteousness, which is of the law. But that is which is through the faith of Christ." The righteousness which is of God by faith. He said, really, those things mean nothing. Not only did those things and eventually, once I found Christ, mean nothing to me, but you know who else they meant nothing to? They meant nothing to Jesus. Why are we here? I'll ask you a question this morning. Why are you here? I'm not talking about church, although we can lump church into it. Why, why are you breathing? Listen, if you're here, I'm speaking to those of you who are saved this morning. I'm including myself. Why are you here? Why is it that whenever we accept salvation, we aren't raptured up out of here? Because we're called to more than just being saved. See, once we're being saved, what's the next step? The next step is after we are saved, after we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Is baptism. The Ethiopian eunuch was out there with Philip in the desert and he's reading. He got him a, book, a copy of Isaiah. This Ethiopian eunuch's walking along and he's somewhere. He's got him a copy of Isaiah and he's reading Isaiah and he comes to know Jesus Christ as his son. Philip comes up and I'm paraphrasing this story, but you go go and look, look at it yourself. Uh, he, he and, and he says, Hey, I, you know, I've been in Paul, made a different character. Philip, rather, they begin talking and he's saved and he says, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, nothing. Let's go find some water. The first thing, once we've been saved, is baptism. Then the, the, then the second thing, after we've been saved, is to join a local New Testament church. 
That's important. We've got to put our, we've got a light once we're saved. In, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, it tells us that we are to put a light on the lampstand. What is the lampstand is the church. So once we've been saved, once we've been baptized, once we've joined the local New Testament church, we've got a couple things now that the Lord has called all of us to do. The first thing and the most important thing is to tell people about Jesus. Amen. You say, well, what can someone who all they know is that they've been saved, that they wasn't and now they are, they can tell people that. They can say, I was lost in my sin. I, I didn't know what to do. Then I found Jesus. I've told you this many times. When Paul was brought up to King Nebuchadnezzar, what did he do? Not King, anyway, what's the king? Agrippa. Nebuchadnezzar threw them Hebrew children in the fire. Anyway, Agrippa. And he says, King Agrippa, you know, they, they're, call, they're calling Paul crazy. They're, they're saying this man has lost his mind. We got him in prison. We're threatening to kill him for what he was doing, and he's still out here doing it. And he gets in front of King Agrippa. Listen, this was a smart man. And what does he do? Does he get in and say, well, King Agrippa, if you'll take his Bible and he'll turn over to the Roman road, I'll, I'll read that Roman road to you. Should we know the Roman road is chosen? Okay, yes, we should know those things. He didn't say, well, this verse here says this. He said, listen, King Agrippa, let me just tell you what happened to me. We can do that. We've been truly saved. The next thing on our agenda is we've got to get in God's word and learn. We've got to study. How are we going to live for Christ if we don't know it? we got to plug into church. Let's start working. That's why we're not raptured out whenever we're saved. Because now there's work to be done. We're not called to sit on our pew and do nothing. We're called to work. Those things meant nothing. But now Paul gets into what really matters. In verse 10. He says that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He says, listen, those things I did, they meant nothing. They didn't matter. Here's what does. That I may know Jesus. That I may know Jesus. And the Power of his resurrection. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you know what truly matters? Listen, you're here at church today, and I'm thankful for that. But coming to church, listening to me talk, even singing songs, when we're talking about salvation, those things don't matter. You say, well, I came to Sunday school, that's great. And it does matter. Salvation. It's just like Paul said, it's dumb. It's worse than that. You say, well, 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 I talked about Jesus and I'm trying to live a good life. That's great. You ought to. But Paul said, God's word says, in the scheme of salvation, that's dumb. That's no good. Do you know Jesus? Do you know the power? Of his resurrection. Do you know the fellowship of his sufferings? Are you willing to be made conformable unto his death? Let me tell you what that means. He said, he, he, he said that I'm so in love with Jesus. I know Jesus as my Savior. I'm saved to the point where if it means that I've got to die the same way that Jesus did, I'm going to allow God to form me into that so I can do it. That's powerful, isn't it? That's not him talking tongue in cheek. That's not him getting in front of a crowd and saying, look at how righteous I am. That's him saying, I'm nothing. I'm so nothing and to the point that I love Jesus and I owe everything to him to the point where if I've got to die a death the same way that Jesus did, I want him to mold me into a place where I can. That's what salvation does. That's, that's what I he said, if by any means that I may obtain, uh, obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> if by any means. You want me to tell you the means in which we have to be saved? I'll tell you again. By faith in Jesus alone. You 
know it's not even by the soil. It's the grace of God. It's by the grace of God that I know Jesus. Let me tell you a little secret this morning. You don't deserve to know Jesus. I don't deserve to know Jesus. I don't deserve heaven. I am a sinner. I'm the worst of the worst. I, I fall short every day. I strive and I'll ask the Lord to help me. And guess what I do? He'll help me. He'll put it in my mind. Don't do that. Remember, you told me to help you. I'm telling you. And I still do. That's pretty bad. Yet by the grace of God, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior through the faith in Him. I want to tell you this morning, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you have never truly trusted in Jesus Christ alone, today is the day. I want to tell you this morning, there's nothing more important, nothing more important in your life than knowing Jesus Christ. It's not the church attendance. It's not the money in the bank account. It's not even doing good works. What really matters, and the question I'm asking you today, do you know Jesus? If you don't, come talk to me. I'll tell you about it. If you're here today and you, you know that the Lord's calling you, won't you tell him yes to that? He's calling you. Won't you come to him? He loves you. He died for you. And he'll save your soul. He'll ask you. Let's all say Won't you come and submit to what the Lord's leading you to? In 445. Uh, we've got some things we need to